Okay, so everyone, welcome to um, Nuclear Fear, uh, Films of the Atomic Age. Uh, my name is Liz. I am one of the adult, um, adult reference librarians, and I am the adult programming coordinator at the Dairy Public Library. And uh, I would like to formally welcome you to a program that has actually been a passion project of mine for, I would say, at least five years when, um, maybe before that, when I started presenting regularly at conventions. This has been an idea that's been rattling around in my head for a long time. So let me pull up the PowerPoint. There we go. Beginning. All right, thank you for your patience, everybody. All right, so films of the atomic age. Um, so just a quick definition of what the atomic age is. It is defined, it's kind of a loose term, especially now because we're still somewhat in the atomic age. It's the period of history that starts from the Trinity test in 1945 to now. And it was actually intended to be an age to signal this idea of progress of new technology, but it's also taken on the idea of impending war and potentially impending doom. The atomic age also saw the only use of nuclear weapons on a civilian population, which is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And for the sake of this program, since the atomic age coincides with the Cold War, I am only going to be focusing on films during the Cold War, partially because the, I would just say, the evolution is more interesting. And also post-Cold War, nuclear fear doesn't factor into films as much. Um, also, just a note, there are going to be some films that are fairly well known that are not in here. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Topaz, was a contender, but it went more into the espionage rather than nuclear anxiety, so not included. Uh, the Paul Newman film, Big Man and Little Boy, more of a historical drama. Dawn's Early Light in the year 2889, Manhattan Project, Special Bulletin, Countdown Through the Looking Glass. In some cases, these are just films that are too similar, and when I'm trying to condense something to kind of show an evolution, in some cases, it just helps to focus on the film that set the trend rather than every film that followed it. So if you do see some ones that omitted, um, I apologize. I tried to get as concise as I could and also keep an account for time because trust me, if I really wanted to, this could be a three hour program. All right, so why this topic? Um, to lighten the mood, I did want to put 30 Rock in there. Um, Again, this sounds like a very morbid topic for anybody to be fascinated with, especially considering I did not really come of age during the Cold War. I was born during it, but by the time I started really getting paying attention to film, that had passed, and the big threat more was terrorism and aliens. Um, a lot of this comes from the fact that from a young age, I was a big fan of the Twilight Zone, and if you watch a lot of those episodes, the nuclear sort of Damocles is hanging over the head of the characters. And I also, on a personal level, I love apocalyptic fiction. I like post-apocalyptic fiction and so much of that deals with nuclear blasts and the aftermath of that. Um, and as I got older and started to kind of see how both film and pop culture in general and society intertwine and how they influence each other, the genesis for this program was born and this idea of kind of trying to see what the nuclear anxieties were throughout the Cold War, because what people were afraid of did change. So we are going to start with the first film. Full disclosure, if I had done this program a year earlier, this would not be the first film I discussed. I actually did not know that this movie existed until very recently, uh, last summer, summer of 2020, when a podcast I was listening to interviewed the author of the book that I recommend at the end. So this is the beginning or the end. And this actually has a very interesting backstory. So it started with, there was a scientist that worked on the Manhattan Project, which built the bombs that were eventually dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He knew Donna Reed. 
he was her teacher and he wrote to her because he said we need to get the story out not only about how these were made but a lot of the scientists had a lot of very real fears and concerns about the power that these bombs had and again when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was an effort by the government to kind of downplay the effect on that. Um, so what started out as a scientist trying to use what little influence in Hollywood he had to warn people, it became a heavily propagandistic film. The US government was very heavily involved and it went from being a warning to a justification for the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which Japan's actions in World War II aside, I, I do think with everything we know now, it's fair to call both of those events an atrocity, even if they ended the war, as one of my older history teachers would say, it can both be a good thing and a very awful thing. And anyone who knows World War II history knows that the allied powers were not exempt from committing awful acts as well. Um, but looking at, at this in the context of 1947, the U.S. government did kind of sense that people were starting to get scared about the amount of power that these bombs had. And in 1946, we saw the release of John Hersey's New Yorker piece on Hiroshima, where he interviewed six survivors. And while it didn't turn a lot of public support against the dropping of the bomb, it did start to scare people about, oh, this stuff can do that. This has this much power. And this is stuff that we had never seen before. This was stuff that we could only conceptualize at the time. So the US government was very heavily involved to essentially sell Americans on the idea of the bomb. Overall, it is not a very remarkable film. Uh, it went through a number of different rewrites. At one point, Anne Rand was going to script this. And, um, it pretty much became a very forgettable B movie. Again, I know a lot about film and I didn't even know this movie existed until last year. Um, there's also some extremely glaring factual inaccuracies in here, probably because they wanted to really sell the justification for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There was, um, in one of the earlier rewrites, there was actually the insinuation that Japan was building a bomb, which isn't true. Uh, Towards the end of the movie, when the Enola Gay is flying, Japanese fighter planes are chasing it, did not happen. Uh, leaflets were dropped to warn people about the dropping of the bomb. That is not true either. And what's interesting is sometimes when you hear people talk about Hiroshima, they do repeat these things. So this film isn't as well known, but some of the narrative that it helped put out there has survived. Um, Overall, I would just say, skip the film, but Greg Mitchell's book, The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, is a very fantastic read and was one of my favorites of last year. Any, move, any book that can combine history and history, politics, and cinema, I'm like, oh, it's a win. So coming up, this is probably the film everyone figured would be the start. Godzilla. So this is the birth of not only one of the most famous monsters in cinema history, it's also the birth of the atomic creature film. And I would say the first major picture to really, I think, really get to the heart of the anxieties about the destruction of the bomb. There actually was a film called Above and Beyond in I think, 1952, which was also about the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima. So Godzilla or Gojira, if you were to go to Japan, they would, that would be how it's pronounced. This is more about the destruction afterwards. And for as cartoony as the series of Godzilla films became, if you watch the original film, it is a somber and very terrifying um, work of science fiction. You have uh, this creature that's been awakened due to atomic testing just rampaging this town and the uh you know the the parallels to the dropping of the bomb are very clear uh the director ishiro honda actually the uh bomb was something that kind of stayed with him a lot while he made films he made a film in the 1960s called attack of the mushroom people that's the english title the japanese one is manguro i believe but even the faces of the people when they're sick, they look very similar to the people who survived the bombs. It's 
the way that this has stayed in the, in the Japanese psyche is obviously very different from how it stayed in the American psyche. Um, I would kind of say it's similar to how like certain, you know, terrorist attacks in the United States have just stayed with us. Um, just a quote from the producer, uh, Tomoyuki Tanaka, the theme of the film from beginning was the terror of the bomb. Mankind had created the bomb and now nature was going to take revenge on mankind. Also, a quick quiz, if anybody knows, this movie was re-edited in the United States and released under the title Godzilla King of the Monsters. Does anyone know the American actor who was edited into the film? Todd, do we have an answer from anyone? Not seeing anyone in the chat. Oh. By the way, quick clarification, the, other, the Japanese title for the other Honda movie was Matango. Matango, thank you. Um, so that is Raymond Burr. So if you have ever seen the American version, Godzilla King of the Monsters, you've seen it with Raymond Burr. Uh, I would recommend watching the original Godzilla. Um, also, as a fun side note, this almost made it into the slideshow. One year at Anime Boston, Todd and I did meet uh, Akira Tak uh, Takarada and Haruo Nakajima, who both starred in Godzilla. Nakajima actually was the eponymous man in the Godzilla suit. Um, but I figured, I think the 30 Rock joke was the most I could get away with. So moving on to this idea that nature was going to take revenge on mankind, we see the same year in the United States, the film Them, which I would say is not at the cinematic level of Godzilla, but still a fun take on kind of the giant monster um, atomic creatures wreaking havoc. Um, so irradiated ants attacking people in New Mexico. And for its time, fairly frightening. Again, you see an ant picking up a rib cage. That is a level of violence that was fairly, for 1954, not seen as much in mainstream films. And for, the, for America, this is probably not the first, but the first, let's just say good, nuclear monster feature because there was a trend through the 50s into the 60s of the just nuclear fallout irradiates animals and they run amok. And again, a lot of that's pulpy, but it does show where the fear was, was the idea of, oh, nuclear radiation is going to do something strange to the environment. And this is also nine years post Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we are starting to get some reports about the after effects of radiation. So moving forward, kind of continuing on that kind of pulpy trend of irradiated monsters, we have Roger Corman schlock called The Day the World Ended. Uh, I do have all the respect in the world for Roger Corman. No one else can make a movie in two days for $4. That's a skill, whether you like his films or not. And um, the interesting thing about this film, it's really not remarkable. Again, it has like survivors of an atomic, atomic war. They have to watch out for radiation poisoning and monsters. But the, the, the film ends with this very optimistic note of the beginning, this idea of after the nuclear fallout, we'll still survive and build a new society. So it's showing in the 1950s, we still had some optimism about, you know, the bomb might be horrifying, the initial damage might be horrifying, there might be some radiation afterwards, but eventually it'll all be good, okay? Meanwhile, back in Japan, um, Akira Kurosawa took on nuclear anxiety in Japan, which again, their nuclear anxiety very different from our nuclear anxiety. And this is about an elderly man who is so scared of nuclear war. Um, you can see here, he sees the sun and thinks that the bomb is coming, it's been dropped, we're burning up. And he wants to sell the family business, move to Brazil for the sake of safety, and the family eventually tries to have him committed. One, not one of his more successful films, um, immediate post, like this came right after The Seventh Samurai, which was a huge hit both he, um, in Japan and abroad, brought him universal acclaim. This is a quieter film that a lot of people saw as a step down. And it has a more ominous ending where there's a doctor that says, who's, you know, basically something along the lines of, who is the crazier person? this old man or those of us who think that he's making a mountain out of a molehill. 
but back in the United States, we're still kind of seeing our fear of mutation. And it's jumped from animals in nature might mutate or we might have monsters to, oh no, I might shrink or I might grow. Um, if you are a fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000, you have seen The Amazing Colossal Man and I believe it was Joel and the Bots riffing on it. But still, you kind of have this idea that the fear of the bomb in the West isn't as heightened as it is where they've actually experienced it. And that all changes in 1959, which one of the best films you're going to discuss, um, Stanley Kramer's On the Beach. And this is a very quiet apocalypse. In this film, the apocalypse has already happened. The nuclear war is hit. The entire Northern Hemisphere has been destroyed. America is gone. Pretty much the entire Northern Hemisphere is. And we have a small group of survivors living in Australia. And at the start of the film, we see them walking the streets, having parties, going to the beach as if everything's normal. And as the film progresses, they start to realize the radiation's coming south. This is it. There's nothing to save us. And there is a scene um, where two characters are talking at a party and it's like, you knew this could happen. Why did you do this? Why did you, th basically, why did you let loose these bombs when you knew that it would kill even the people that survived the initial blast? And uh, there's a really heartbreaking subplot with Anthony Perkins and his family where they have a young daughter and they eventually decide to take the, um, the government essentially or what remains of a government has um, suicide pills and they just decide well rather than die of radiation poisoning we'll choose our time to go it's a very bleak and somber film but it's also i think a fantastic movie and especially when you look at what a post-apocalyptic films become stuff like this isn't made that way anymore i would say probably the most if i had to compare it to a film that came out fairly recently, I would almost think of The Road because The Road is a far more contemplative post-apocalyptic film, but even The Road still has action and a lot of other shocking things in there that Cormac McCarthy puts in there just to make us feel sad. So our first video clip of the night is going to be the final minute or so of On the Beach. So I told you earlier, the streets at the beginning of the film are bustling. We are going to see the final shots, which is a deserted Sydney, Australia, and keep an eye out for the final shot of the film. So as heavy handed as that final shot may seem now, keep in mind that if you were making this film in the late 50s or seeing it, that probably would, I would almost say definitely, have a profound impact on you. The idea of there is still time to prevent this end for humanity. And again, this is where I say like, oh, it's going to start to get sad, get sad, everybody. But we do have a comedic break coming soon. But before we go, we're going to kind of stay with British filmmaking with The Day the Earth Caught Fire. So this is actually, despite the um, title, not about a nuclear blast. So this is actually a film where there's nuclear bomb testing and they're doing so much, they end up throwing the Earth off of its orbit and it's moving towards the sun. Um, Kind of similar, speaking of the Twilight Zone, to the plot of The Midnight Sun, only we don't know exactly what caused that catastrophe. Um, but there is this um, idea in the background that the main character the reporter has of like, oh, I knew that this would lead to 
the end of humanity in some way, shape, or form. And at the end of the film, we don't know if Earth is saved. We just see two newspapers. One is Earth saved and one is Earth doomed. And it is this idea of you know, we're starting to see in these films that we are going to be the bringers of our own destruction. Um, it's actually, I did get the more the uh, newer edition of this for the library if you would like to watch it. It's a good example of a British genre called Cozy Catastrophes. Uh, Day of the Triffids is like this as well, where the world is ending, but it's also still focused on people kind of staying together. There's no, we don't really see the full worldwide extent of the destruction. It's very localized. Um, I wonder if that had something to do with budget, potentially. Um, where are we going up to next? So we're going back to pulp for a moment with Panic in Year Zero. I mean, if there's ever been a pulpy exploitation-y tagline, look at that one, an orgy of looting and lust. Um, this is directed by Ray Milland, who is pretty, you know, he's he has a long list of credits in kind of this sort of a frame of film. So rather than something that's hokey, like the day the world ended, where it's like, oh no, there's monsters. This one doesn't have monsters. This is just a family trying to survive after a nuclear attack. And rather than monsters and irradiated ants, the only threat that really exists is humans. So we're starting to see this turn from, we have to worry about monsters or these like imagined sci-fi fears to something that we know all well, which is people when they're desperate can be very frightening. So on to Ladybug, Ladybug, which I would say is probably one of the most upsetting films I have ever seen because it all involves kids. Um, this is actually directed by Frank Perry and written by his wife, Eleanor Perry. The source of this is a little iffy because I've seen that it came from a McCall's piece, but the piece was published a month before the film came out. And I'm like, unless she had advanced knowledge of this story, I don't know how she got it. So potentially she had heard about the story and the McCall's piece is something that um, documents it. I believe the piece is called They Thought It Was War. Basically these children are at school. It's an unnamed town. All we know is that it's rural. The houses are fairly remote and they hear the alarm of it's a bomb. And no one in the film knows if it's real. We never find out if it's real or not. And the kids have to make their way home and that alone is a terrifying prospect. There could be missiles flying in the sky and kids have to walk home. Just, um, and you also start to see even kids have this very cruel survival streak. The kids do find a shelter and one girl who's kind of the queen bee of the class tells another girl like, sorry, there's too many people. You just can't come in. And the way that that girl who's kicked out, her story arc ends is her running through a junkyard, sobbing and finding a refrigerator and putting herself in there to protect herself. And either way, this is not gonna end well because if it's real and there's a bomb that is not protecting her, um, despite when Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull told you. And if it's not real, you cannot get out of a refrigerator. This girl's likely going to suffocate to death. Again, it is one of the most upsetting things I have seen put on film and I have seen a number of upsetting things. And the film ends with this kid going out to try to find this girl to bring her back. And all he sees is a plane in the sky and just starts to scream. And that is the end of the film. So this was made as a direct response to the Cuban Missile Crisis and this idea of like, what effect is this, again, nuclear sort of Damocles having on kids? Um, and it doesn't shock me to find out that this film really didn't do that well. And for a while, it was almost a forgotten film. The only reason it kind of had any second life was there were a few people that remembered it and started to blog about it, ask about it online. and. YouTube, which YouTube is a source for a lot of horrible things like the rest of the internet, but YouTube is actually a great source for a lot of these smaller out of print movies. Um, Ladybug, Ladybug is up there in full, so you don't have to spend any money to watch it. But it is, again, a for a film that came out in 1963, I'm like, 
it, it is one where I'm like, I don't even think this could be made today. This is too terrifying. So we're going to go on to definitely a more well-known title. The first big nuclear film of 1964, which is Fail Safe, directed by the great Sidney Lumet. Um, I mean, fantastic director. I hope everyone's seen at least one of his movies. So based on a novel, and this is a Cold War thriller about an accidental first strike and bombers are mistakenly sent to the USSR. And rather than what we have seen so far, which is civilians dealing with the war, this is sort of the military brass trying to basically stop a war. And of course, mutually assured destruction comes up. Um, if you're not familiar with that term as it relates to the Cold War, it was the idea of whoever fires first, someone is going to fire back and it ends well for nobody. And uh, great film. It was remade about, I think, 20 years ago with George Clooney. And I actually think a fairly good remake, although I think the effect on it is lost because it came out in the aughts where, again, nuclear war was not at the forefront of our minds in terms of what could, or I should say nuclear war within established state was not at the forefront of our minds in terms of how the world could end. And this is a dueling film. I mean, unfortunately, I hate to cut this one short, but I think probably our most well-known movie of the night, Dr. Strangelove, um, the Cold War comedy from Stanley Kubrick. Um, okay, so like Failsafe, rather than looking at the civilian perspective, we have the military brass, um, Peter Sellers playing multiple characters. Also, great performance by George C. Scott. I actually think a very underrated performance of his. Uh, the War Room, Look at War, which you can't fight in the War Room. And the way this all starts is this unhinged general orders a strike against the USSR and just chaos ensues. Um, so why did Stanley Kubrick have the idea to make this a comedy? Because initially it was conceived as a thriller, a straight, straightforward thriller, more akin to Failsafe or another film that Kubrick was going to do the Bedford incident, which he eventually passed on because he had a similar vision for it as he did for this, and um, the rest is history. So as Kubrick says, quote, my idea of doing it as a nightmare comedy came in the early weeks of working on the screenplay. I found that in trying to put the meat on the bones and to imagine the scenes fully, one had to keep leaving out of it things that were either absurd or paradoxical in order to keep it from being funny. And these things seem closer to the heart of the scenes in question. So it really does become in some ways a comedy of errors in terms of is the world going to end or not. Um, it, a, a very, again, films like this are a tightrope to walk and Dr. Strangelove walks it perfectly. Um, although I wonder if the reason we didn't see too many Cold War comedies after that was either it still might have been too fresh of a wound. Again, this is two years post Cuban Missile Crisis, or the idea that everyone looked at this and said, no, this is too hard. It's easier to play it straight. And because I didn't want to not play a clip from Dr. Strangelove, again, a little comedy of errors talking to um, the leader of a country you might have accidentally launched some missiles at or an unhinged rogue general launched, some launched an airstrike at. Hello? Uh, hello, hello, Dimitri. Listen, I, I can't hear too well. Do you suppose you could turn the music down just a little? Uh-huh, that's much better. Yes. Fine, I can hear you now, Dimitri. Clear and plain and coming through fine. I'm coming through fine too, eh? Good. Then, well then, as you say, we're both coming through fine. Good. Well, it's good that you're fine and, and I'm fine. I agree with you. It's great to be fine. <laughs> now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. Well, now, what happened is um, one of our base commanders, he had a sort of, well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, just a little funny. And uh, he went and did a silly thing. 
Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. Well, let me finish, Dimitri. <laughs> let me finish, Dimitri. Well, listen, how do you think I feel about it? Can you imagine how I feel about it, Dimitri? Why do you think I'm calling you? Just to say hello? Of course I like to speak to you. Of course I like to say hello. Not now, but any time, Dimitri. I'm just calling up to tell you something terrible has happened. It's a friendly call. Of course it's a friendly call. Listen, if it wasn't friendly, you probably wouldn't have even got it. <laughs> so again, the idea of just the world ending with Citizens doing duck and cover and hiding in what little shelters they have, but um, the top brass of the military just quietly trying to eat snacks while listening in on a phone conversation. It is a level of absurdity that I don't think can be replicated, and I think there's a reason this film has endured the way it has. Although I would say if anyone can make a modern day Dr. Strangelove type of film, it would have to be Armando Iannucci. Um, I, if you've never seen The Death of Stalin, take the opportunity to do so. So we're going to unfortunately get back to the harsh realities of war with the war game. So this is a film that was seen, I think, by Amer uh, Americans in the 60s, but not seen in the BBC until the 1980s. The BBC thought this was too frightening for prime time and did not show it. Uh, obviously, so if you're not familiar, the BBC has a lot more um, govern, uh, control over what people do and don't see, unlike in the United States where it kind of depends, especially nowadays, more on whether or not advertisers are okay with it. Um, but in terms of film in general, the BBC has a level of ability to censorship that this country does not have. Um, so it's a docudrama. It's less than an hour long, and it's basically a fictionalized take on what would happen if a nuclear strike hit Britain. And for something that is black and white, made for almost no budget, it is still harrowing. And the final line of this film, which I put here, is, um, is there, uh, um, there, uh, sorry, lost my ability to talk on almost an entire subject of nuclear weapons, on the problems of their possession, on effects of their use, there is now practically a total silence in the press, in official publications, and on television. There is hope in any unresolved and unpredictable situation, but there is a, but is there any real hope to be found in silence? And I do wonder if that closing narration, it's never been confirmed, the official BBC reasoning has been, it was just too graphic, but I wonder if that idea of we're seeing silence from the press as well was something that got under some people's skin. It was eventually shown in 1985 alongside um, the re uh, the um, the re-airing of a film called Threads, which we'll talk about in the 1980s as well, which you might be familiar with as kind of the uh, Britain answer to the day after. So there is going to be a little bit of a 10 year gap in terms of a lot of nuclear anxiety film. This is not to say that a lot of these, these films weren't made, there were, but there was never really anything new added to the genre. It was stuff that was kind of copies of Panic in Year Zero, The Day the World Ended. Um, again, we had an, espion an espionage thriller by Alfred Hitchcock called Topaz, but especially in the United States, our anxieties and our thoughts seem to be elsewhere. We had the Vietnam War going on. Um, we'd had the assassination of the president in 1963. We had a lot of social movements in the United States. And in the late 60s and early 70s, we saw the collapse of the old Hollywood system and the birth of new Hollywood cinema, which gave us a lot of auteurs who were not extremely interested in you know, just telling pulpy, sto um, pulpy stories or monster movies. This is where we got the films like Bonnie and Clyde. This is where we had Francis Ford Coble and Martin Scorsese get their start. So the landscape of Hollywood was different and the stories that a lot of these creatives wanted to tell were different as well. Um, and in 1975, we see 
a boy and his dog. And we kind of see, I would say, not quite the birth, but I would say the realization of the post-apocalyptic film. Uh, this is starring Don Johnson, so if you're familiar with him from being in shows like Watchmen or movies like Knives Out Now, this is a first major role for him, or if you grew up watching him in Miami Vice, either way, different role for him, uh, based on a novella by Harlan Ellison, so this is a boy and a telepathic dog just walking through post-nuclear United States trying to avoid people, they run into like an underground group that traps men for breeding, a little bit of kind of fantasy elements in there. Um, and also both nihilistic and funny, the ending of the film is one that still shocks me in terms of how brutal it is. Um, and also kind of, again, really good at balancing that dark humor, but we, we have the full tropes of the person traveling the irradiated wasteland, the kind of, we see this in Mad Max too, sort of apocalypse, uh, not apocalypse chic, but definitely wearing whatever clothing you can. Um, it's, we're seeing the birth of this genre here, and we still kind of see it when we see a lot of post-apocalyptic film. If you want to see another film that's sort of emblematic of this is a film, really fun movie called Damnation Alley. Another one of those, there was a nuclear war, we're all living in the wasteland now. Um, more fun, or the, I would say the first three, well, Mad Max Fury Road counts too, although the effects are very different, but um, Mad Max Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome also this idea of there was a nuclear war and we're all just trying to survive. Um, this is kind of where I would say is sort of the start of it, going from the kind of small pulpy movies to becoming slightly bigger funded productions. So with the China syndrome, we see a different type of nuclear fear. And the one that, especially after um, Chernobyl and Fukushima, that when we think of nuclear fear, this is our first thought, the idea of a nuclear power plant failing. So the China syndrome is actually, I would say, pretty solid thriller um, about a TV reporter played by Jane Fonda. She discovers um, safety cover-ups and just really bad safety in nuclear power plant. Um, I had to check the dates on this because when I initially um, saw this film, I think I figured that it must have been inspired by Three Mile Island. It was not. It was inspired by another near accident that had happened, I believe, in the early 70s. And this was actually released uh, like before Three Mile Island by like two weeks. I think the premiere was technically March 14th. Three Mile Island happens March 18th. And kind of not a good look for the nuclear power industry who did say that the film was a gross misrepresentation of safety. And um, if you do want to look in archives, there are New York Times, New York Times still does have up the nuclear experts debating the China syndrome. Uh, but they went on this whole thing of this is nowhere even close to true, nuclear power plants are very safe, and then you just have a very poorly timed accident like Three Mile Island. Um, uh, just once. So what is the China syndrome, by the way? Just what does that mean? It means there is a an accident so bad that the reactor and all of the containment structures will just melt into the earth, quote, all the way to China. And basically that idea of the, the it's scorched earth at that point. And what I find interesting thinking about the China syndrome and just thinking about accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima is how much both this and real life accidents have covered people's opinion of the nuclear power industry, which there are plenty of countries and places that have nuclear plants that have not had accidents, but these accidents are so burrowed into our minds versus Exxon, we have the Exxon Valdez, we have the BP oil spill, we have a lot of accidents with natural gas, but that does not seem to have and instill the same terror into us that um, you know, a nuclear power plant accident could have. Probably, which is true, if a nuclear power plant accident hit worst case scenario, it's a far worse situation. But it's interesting how that stuff like really sticks with our imagination in a way that an oil spill does not. Um, there are still people who, when they talk about why nuclear power makes them nervous, they're like, oh, well, remember Chernobyl, which 
Um, you know, there have been plenty of books written about Chernobyl. It was far more real incompetence and cover by the Soviet government than just nuclear power not being safe. Um, although I will say credit to the um, recent HBO miniseries, that was their focus was the cover up of it rather than just a scare piece, which I will say looking at something like the China syndrome in 2021, it does come across as a bit of a scare piece, but one that does have a grain of truth to it. So we are moving in to the 1980s and probably the just, I have never, when you look at this stuff all like in a sequence, you see how scared people were in the 1980s and seeing that, you know, for a while it seemed like after the Cuban Missile Crisis and after our thoughts were on Vietnam and other issues, this idea of like, okay, maybe we're not that close to where maybe we can relax. Well, if you know anything about history, uh, definitely tensions ramped up in the early 80s. And we had a lot of uh, films to show for that and really reflected how freaked out people were. So the first is a really interesting find that I heard about on a podcast called 80s All Over, which this is a fun little watch. Um, it's the, the narrative is basically just look at all these old, um, you know, propaganda films. And some of it's terrifying because you realize when uh, some of where they're taking this footage is like right in testing grounds and none of the people that are being filmed have any idea how dangerous what they're standing next to is in terms of radiation and poisoning and safety. Uh, it's a really interesting artifact. Um, so it has both those like duck and cover films, the um, government testing films and kind of those like, hey, isn't this great? We now have uh, nuclear power, which can lead to a lot of great things for us. And considering it came out one year before we had like a quadruple feature of films that were, oh my God, nuclear bombs could kill us all. It's a really interesting contrast. So we're going to get into 1983, um, probably the lightest film of this year that deals with the um, possibility of nuclear destruction uh, is War Games, uh, the Matthew Broderick film. That is where a little, uh, you know, teenage hacker um, accesses a military supercomputer, which can both predict and launch nuclear war and nuclear missiles. And the climax of the film is they're trying to introduce the idea of like zero sum game and no winners to this computer. And it plays out all of these different scenarios where it's like, oh, no matter what the scenario is, no one really wins in a nuclear war. And probably the most well-known line is the, I have this here, the only winning move is not to play. And this is a film that Ronald Reagan viewed. Um, it actually, it didn't really change his mind too much about nuclear war, but it did get him and a lot of other uh, government brass a little worried about uh, security on military supercomputers, which fair, I mean, that stuff could be pretty bad in the wrong hands. But the next one we are going to talk about, Ronald Reagan did view in advance and it actually did have an effect on him. And that is the day after um, the, probably the, the most well-known other than Roots, television film of all time. I think it's the most viewed, although Roots I think might count as a mini series. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that, but this is directed by Nicholas Meyer, um, probably most well known for Star Trek Wrath of Khan. Oh, he did not have a fun time making this feature. He had a ver vision for a longer film and actually a lot more hard hitting in terms of the impact blast scene and ABC decided, no, thank you. And so he just said, I'm ne never working in TV again after this. Um, so it debuted November 20th in 1983 on ABC. Um, so watched by 38.5 million households, which is really unheard of now. The only TV event now that would get close, like that amount would be a Super Bowl. Um, and they estimated 100 million people watched it because he took into account everyone in the households. Uh, if anyone was a fan of the FX series, The Americans, uh, there is a season three uh, episode that does reference this. And I sh it's, it's a fun thing to watch because they did actually go back and get historical consultants to kind of say like, are we doing this right? Because 
this film was a big deal. There were discussions in school about like the kids were kid, uh, parents were wondering, should my kids watch this? Teachers were like, how we're going to have discussions after this aired. Like there was, there was already the very real fear of could this happen? But then there was also the idea of should we let kids watch this because it will scare them? And it's like, you know, I just think from hindsight, it is this idea of, so your kids know this can happen already and you're worried about a fictional version of this scaring them, guess what? Kids are already frightened. Um, and actually another, I would say shout out to YouTube is there was a discussion panel that had Carl Sagan on it, um, William F. Buckley and a lot of other uh, people in the military, people in the nuclear industry debating this film and talking about you know, what would happen if a war really broke out and how well we would fare, which spoiler alert, Carl Sagan tells us not well, uh, moderated by Ted Koppel. And you can find that on YouTube. So sometimes YouTube can be a treasure trove for genuinely great stuff that's archived. Um, and Ronald Reagan did view this movie on October 10th. And he, um, I found from his online um, library, he said, quote, Columbus Day. In the morning at Camp D, I ran the tape of the movie ABC is running on the air November 20th. It's called The Day After. It has Loris, Kansas wiped out by nuclear war with Russia. It's powerfully done, all seven million worth, which for 1983, that is a lot to spend on a TV movie. It's very effective and left me greatly depressed. So far, they haven't sold any of the 25 ads scheduled and I can see why. Whether it will be of help to the anti-nukes or not, I can't say. My own reaction was one, of our having to do all we can to have a deterrent and see that there is never a nuclear war. Back to WH White House. I mean, this did also inspire him to continue with his Star Wars program, but there definitely was for him and for a lot of uh, world leaders, this idea of seeing this, though it's fictional, played out, it did realize, oh, if this happens, this isn't going to end well. It's not going to end with just the bomb dropping. There's going to be survival and in this film we meet a large cast of characters some people who work at a hospital some people who work at a university there's a family that lives on a farm and those that aren't killed in the blast essentially just slowly die of radiation poisoning the final shot of the film is uh the main one of the main characters just driving back to his home to find i mean he knows that his home is in the town that was hit. So find what is left of his wife and just breaking down and crying. And it's a, again, for 1983, playing this on the air in prime time, you can see why people were like, should my, do even I want to watch this? This sounds depressing, but for people making this and you can go back and find that there's archival like making of footage, they really were like, we need to make this as a message film to show, hey, this is the end result of this. It's not going, you know, if this stuff is, if this stuff hits us, we're, we're going to die. Um, because again, by the eighties, we fully well saw like what happened to people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki where they had radiation sickness, sometimes hitting them decades after um, and just injuries that never fully healed. So we're, I'm gonna play the impact scene in the day after is long. It's about six minutes. And for the sake of time, I can't play that. So I'm only gonna play a minute. But just some of the effects might be dated, but just take a look at how they kind of try to portray people being vaporized and killed instantly. And imagine being a viewer watching this in 1983, especially if you're on the younger side.
So again, imagine being 10 years old and watching that and just already hearing in the news that tensions are escalating with the Soviet Union and thinking, oh goodness, is this what life has in store for me? This is the film that uh, a lot of people who did see it were like one of the scariest films I've ever seen. It gave me nightmares. Um, I think who called, someone said like the movie that traumatized a bunch of 80s kids. Um, it is, uh, this is also a free and full on YouTube if you would like to watch it. Um, definitely a little bit dated, but for whatever reason, there's still a lot of it that still hits, especially the latter half of the film where it's just, I would, hes it's not, I'd hesitate to call it misery porn because I think the point of this film is showing that there is no easy way to rebuild after this. There is going to be death and like, there's even a discussion with the farmers of like, we can't even use this soil. We can't grow anything. How are we going to have food? It's a depressing, depressing film, but the reality of war is fairly depressing. So we're going to move on to Barefoot Gen, uh, the, one of the two animated films we have in this program. So while the day after was an imagined nuclear strike, um, an imagined bomb being dropped on the country, Barefoot Gen is about Hiroshima. Um, and actually seeing, you know, it is about a six-year-old boy who survives the bombing of Hiroshima. He loses a lot of his family. I think he, his mother dies soon after and he has to, oh no, he loses his baby sister as well. This is probably one of the saddest films you will ever see. Um, directed by Moro Masaki, but um, the creator of this, um, the manga that this film is based on is Kenji Nakazawa. So he is someone who actually survived the Hiroshima bombing. And um, he's an interesting person in and of itself. Like he passed away a few years ago. So he was born in 1939 in March. So he's just about six when this hit. And his father was uh, not a big supporter of the militarization of um, during World War II. His father was a sign painter but had been imprisoned by the Japanese police because he had spoken out against the military and I think on one occasion uh, painted anti-military graffiti. And he is someone who is um, kind of, as I said earlier, the idea of I think a citizen should be able to look at their country and say we have done things that are good but we've also done things that are bad. Is someone that um, has always been vocally uh, critical of the Japanese actions during World War II, as a lot of people, artists who came out of post-war Japan were. Um, and also one that says, you know, I think Japan does sometimes doesn't talk about some of their other things that happened during World War II. And throughout his life, he was a pacifist and someone fairly um, always against the idea of Japan ramping up their military presence again. And because he basically says for him, he's like, I have seen the end result of war. And it's for him, it was the immediate loss of his father and I think two of his siblings, and then later the loss of his mother and his baby sister. Um, uh, so again, this is uh, Japan, the way Japan's dealt with the war is is an interesting one because Having been to the Hiroshima Museum and watched a lot of media and the way they talk about it in their, um, in their pop culture, there is never an anti-American sentiment. There is always, it's more of this idea of this is what war does. Um, and if you go to the Hiroshima Museum, there's more of a, a sense of we're doing this to give you a warning. We have experienced this, so we're telling you what happened so this won't be repeated. Um, and Barefoot Gen is actually, especially when it got a release in the West and was translated, was fairly influential among anti-nuclear proliferation activists uh, because they said this is a, this is an account. It is fictionalized, but a lot of the bones of this story come from Kenji Nakazawa's actual uh, real life. Um, also, if you'd like to see another film about Japan in World War II that kind of shows that the um, the, I would say the human, the civilian toll of war uh, is Grave of the Fireflies as well, which is Iseo Takahata's story about two kids who are essentially abandoned during World War II. And both of these films tend to not um, pull punches in terms of 
you know, yes, we have our faults as well. Um, again, I would say if you've never read um, the book, I don't know if, I think they're also available in English, but I would still highly recommend seeing both of these films, just have some tissues ready. So second to last clip, we are going to watch the um, Hiroshima bombing scene from Barefoot Again. So I would say, keep in mind, we just watched um, a fictionalized scene of destruction of Lawrence, Kansas, but in reality, this didn't happen. So keep in mind, this was initially written by someone who experienced it. So what we're seeing happen here happened in real life. So as difficult as that clip is to watch, one of the things I like from a film and storytelling perspective is you find out towards the end that everything that you had just watched took place in a matter of seconds. And I think that is the most horrifying aspect of all is all that destruction happened in an instant. So we're coming up on the end, um, we're, don't worry everyone, we're still gonna be sad. Um, there's no, there's no fun times in war. Um, one, uh, probably the other film I would absolutely recommend checking out, and I would say up there with On the Beach in terms of a great film just about, with you know no special effects, no big bomb scene, um, but just about the human reaction to war is 1983's Testament. I think the one film we have here that was directed by a woman, Lynn Littman, and this is a mother, she's played by Jane Alexander in an Oscar-nominated performance. Uh, she just tries to keep her family together and alive after a nuclear blast. They live in an outskirt town of San Francisco. Husband's at work. Um, she's trying to just keep her kids, you know, doing homework in the afternoon. And all of a sudden they hear a get away from the windows, um, you know, special emergency. And 
next scene, they're all walking out in the street. They don't have power. They don't have water. And it's probably, I would say, the most realistic look at how society would probably break down post-nuclear strike. Where as much as, you know, the Mad Maxes and the Boy and His Dog films of the world show kind of a, an almost fun or a stylized version of a post-apocalyptic future, this just shows, no, things are going to slowly break down because people keep getting sick. We don't have anyone to do small things like pick up the trash. Pretty soon all the doctors are getting sick and most heartbreakingly, the children start to get sick. It's a, like, again, I would not watch the day after Barefoot Again and Testament all in one day. You will need an entire bottle full of liquor afterwards. Um, but it's also partial, I would say it's part of it is almost a beautiful film as well because the end, um, Jane Alexander's character tries to be as optimistic as possible and she just tells her one remaining child um, who's having his birthday and she asks, well, what should we wish for? And she just says that we remember it um, for pretty much for the sake of anyone that survives. And Roger Ebert, who gave this a four-star review and also said the film made him cry, he, uh, I pulled a quote from his review where he says, we never even see a mushroom cloud. We never even know who started the war. Instead, Testament is a tragedy about manners. It asks how we might act towards one another, how our values might stand up in the face of overwhelming catastrophe. And actually, I will say, unlike a fil films like A Boy and His Dog or Mad Max, which tend to be a lot more nihilistic or something even like Panic in Year Zero, Testament, you do see this community try to pull together as much as they can. There's still conflict, but you do have people looking out for each other, um, taking in kids who both of their parents were at work, trying to care for people who can't care for themselves. Again, that's why I'd say, like I agree with Ebert in that it is a secretly optimistic film, but still uh, gutting, a gutting feature. So moving on to Threads, um, again, gets the reputation of being the BBC's answer to the day after. Um, so this is broadcast one, roughly one year after um, the day after. So this is September of 1984 and watched by almost 7 million households in Britain. So it's somewhat similar to the day after, only it's a bit more focused of a narrative. You don't have the large cast of characters. You just have a woman named Ruth who's expecting her boyfriend and her family and her boyfriend's family. And it has a similar strike scene to the day after, but the picture that it paints post-nuclear blast is even bleaker than the day after. And it is unfortunately not as optimistic as Threads where we pull together. It is this idea of people are going to scrunch for whatever they can to survive. And it gives us this um, 10 years in the future where society has really broken down and life expectancy is nothing. And it shows you what the next generation might look like. And uh, I'll just say, it's not a rosy picture. Um, again, another one of those, don't watch the day after and threads back to back. You're not going to have a great time. So sticking with Britain, the other animated film of the, of the night is When the Wind Blows. So kind of continues the cozy catastrophe. This is an elderly couple. Um, they first hear the nuclear war is coming. They try to prepare. The war happens and you then just slowly see them die from radiation poisoning. And again, you do kind of wonder, like, why would anyone write this and make this and make us watch this? Well, for a lot of filmmakers and for a lot of people who were writing, they saw this as an opportunity to warn people and say, well, what's the worst outcome of a nuclear war? This nice couple that reminds you of your grandma and grandpa slowly dying of radiation poisoning maybe we shouldn't just be stockpiling nukes um, and potentially think about setting them off. Uh, again, it's, it, it's, I do find it interesting that to, as we get more into the 80s, the films get more and more like, oh, I can't watch this like in one sitting, I have to take a break. So we have one more film to discuss. And um, I am going to give, set up the film for you. So the film is Miracle Mile. It starts off pretty light and breezy. Boy meets girl, the boy and the girl hit it off. They decide to meet for a date. The boy oversleeps and tries to call her to say like, I'm sorry, uh, power went out, the alarm clock didn't work. So he's waiting for her call. 
And then this happens in what I would like to call probably the most severe left turn in any film I have ever seen. Like what we have had preceding this is like a light, funny, romantic comedy. And then this happens. So I will just say, uh, content warning, you are going to hear some language dropped. Exactly, you're talking about. I'm talking about some really fucking war. Who is this? Where's my dad? Go get my dad. Your dad? Well, 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 there's nobody here. Where, 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 where is he supposed to be? How the hell would I know? You're in Orange County. I'm in North Dakota. Hey, is this some kind of prank or something? Prank? Prank? Oh God, is this two five four nine four one one? Uh, yeah, 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 it is, but it, listen, it, it's just a phone booth. It, it's, a, it's a phone booth at a coffee shop. I, I heard it ringing. Is this 714? Did I dial 213? Shit! All right, all right, look, that's enough. This is a joke, right? Security, can I trace you? Listen, it's probably a felony to joke around on the phone like this. Who are you? Who am I? Listen, I'm just a guy who picked up the phone. I mean, I don't know if this is a, if this is the wrong phone number or a, or a joke or what. What what happened to Chip? He, he was just joking, right? Look at everything you just heard. Go back to sleep. <laughs> so yeah, imagine being in the theater and watching 15 minutes of a nice, you know, young couple meeting and then getting this and being like, uh, what's this movie now? So Miracle Mile, uh, this is our last film of the night. I do have to unfortunately wrap up a bit. Um, one of my favorite movies. This isn't the final like big film that deals with nuclear fallout during the Cold War. That would be an HBO feature called Dawn's Early Light. But I would say in terms of just something stylistically and narratively, Miracle Mile is, uh, uh, it's j there's no, there's very few other movies like it that just kind of hit you and give you a great adrenaline rush. Um, so as you see with the phone call that caller said, oh, we've got 75 minutes. The film, the rest of the movie roughly takes place in real time as the main character, Harry, played by Anthony Edwards, tries to get in touch with this new girl that he met. And also this idea of, am I, like, cause he tells people about the phone call he heard. And actually there's a few, there's one person at this diner is like, that sounds legit. I can't get in touch with a lot of my friends in Washington. They're going to the Southern Hemisphere. This sounds suspicious. So we do wonder through most of the movie, is this a real call or not? Or was this all a prank? Um, and it also does a good first person perspective with Harry. We never leave him narratively. And it has one dynamite ending. Um, it's a movie that once it hits the gas pedal, it does not let go until the film ends. It's a, um, it's just a different type of, I would say, a nuclear anxiety film. Uh, it's very, I would say, intimate because we never leave Harry's side and we don't really see too much of an impact shot or too much action until the end of the movie. But it's this great idea of, it plays with you, is this real or is it not? And you start to see as the film goes on, more and more people are hearing this rumor of bombs are gonna hit LA. 
Um, also, this was initially conceived, or for a while it was conceived as a Twilight Zone movie. Um, and you can, if you watch it, you can see why, but if it's a great film, it didn't hit at the box office, but it had a great life on VHS, and now it is a very well-loved cult classic. So, quick note on post-Cold War, obviously, once the Cold War died, the idea of we're going to exchange nukes with Russia really dropped and fell away. We had a few films like Broken Arrow, this idea of like a rogue person stealing um, weapons. We've had biopics like 13 Days, and we had The Sum of All Fears, which is the idea of a terrorist stealing nuclear weapons. Um, but we really haven't seen a lot of atomic fear movies. I think the close we can maybe have is The Road, but there's always been debate as to what the big disaster in The Road was, because it's never named. Um, in the 90s, we saw the resurgence more of uh, aliens attacking features, um, because I think we kind of had this idea of, oh, we don't have a real threat over our heads, let's go for one that we know isn't real. And then the post 9-11 world, we had, uh, we definitely had a lot of films dealing with terrorism. And as the, you know, global market blew up and the franchises became bigger, we've just had, you know, superheroes battling whatever the threat of the day is. Um, so we've really, I think, I haven't seen a film that deals with like a lot of the dread that I see in these films, the most that um, I think comes close are films that deal with ecological disasters. Um, and not goofy ones like The Day After, but uh, Snowpiercer is a great film that deals with the aftermath of an e uh, just an ecological disaster and this idea of, yes, the world really can end if the climate changes enough. So again, uh, don't have too much time for questions, but I can take a few. And I'll stop screen sharing. Alrighty, um, does anyone have any questions or comments or any movies look interesting? I guess I have, I have a, a, what is with the, the Japanese, with the animation as far as instead of real time, you know, uh, I, I, you know, as opposed to a regular movie, what I would, you know, I mean, like that one in, in, in the, uh, the atomic movie in, in animation. I don't know. Uh, why they did, an oh, why they did animation. Yeah, why, yeah, why, did, why they did it in animation, yeah. Um, I guess I there's no we With Barefoot again, I think it was because Nakazawa's medium was in comics beforehand. And in Japan, animation is seen as an acceptable form of storytelling for all ages. I mean... Barefoot Gen scared a lot of young people in the West because parents figured, oh, this must be good for kids. No, it's not. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't um, imagine that. Usually the question I get about animation is what's with the eyes, which is where I'm like, I guess the quickest answer I can give is um, Tezuka, who created Astro Boy, was really, really loved Snow White and the look of Snow White. And he did that with his art and that just became widely copied. <laughs> I mean, it but seems even then, a that's a very quick answer for that. But yeah. I think for, for Barefoot Gen, it was, I, I also think for the time in the 80s, they might have just said it's easier to portray this that's true, more yeah. horrifically than it would be in live action. Because I look at the scenes in the day after and I'm like, okay, that looks a little hokey now. Whereas I watch Barefoot Gen and that scene is still terrifying. Yeah, that. that it's it's a miracle he survived. I don't. It's it's. it's he, I think he got buried under rubble. And um, but, yeah, his his personal story. If you ever want to look him up, he uh, a very remarkable person. Who mm -hmm. basically is he? He figured he survived for a reason, and he basically saw that as his way of well, I'm going to tell my to my story to the world, and became was an activist for um pacifism and against nuclear proliferation, I think, until he died. Um, any other questions? Because unfortunately, I do have to end so this can record and we can close up. Um, so one more question or comment? I just have a quick question. Sure. It seemed like the movies were clustered around um, of just following a, a real life ac um, accident. Mm -hmm. So Three Mile Island in the early 80s, was that correct? Uh, Three Mile Island was 79. 
So, because you did bring up the China syndrome. So, this, so the correlation was there and in the 50s um, after World War II stuff. Yeah, it's, it, it kind of, that's what I've noticed. Like some of it came in waves in terms of there would be an event or there would also be a big movie and same thing that happens today, people try to imitate it. Like Them was a very popular film when it came out. So we saw a slew of giant monster movies, giant irradiated creatures. And for 1983, that was just tensions with the Soviet Union were really ramping up. And uh, people, I did ask my parents, I'm like, so what was that like at the time? Like, oh no, because they were in the service at that point. Like, yeah, we were really on edge at that point. Funnily enough, neither of them had even heard of the day after. I think my dad would explain to him vaguely, and I'm like, didn't you people watch television back then? And of course the answer is no. <laughs> um, I have one question in the chat, and then unfortunately I'm gonna have to end the program. It says, I feel like post 9-11 movies take terrorism and extremism seriously, and morally have had a hard time getting the mainstream success or that take it seriously have had the mainstream success the same kind of horrifying pictures about nuclear paranoia did why do you think that is um i do wonder if some of it has to do with like what gets money what gets distribution because as hollywood has definitely had to play to the global market and also the 80s saw the rise of the consumer teenager which you didn't have in the fifth as much in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I think there was this idea of we don't want to make serious movies. And I just I uh, the way America that the way America dealt with post 9-11 terrorism could probably be a program in and of itself because I think that there was a lot that people wanted to address in film, but then there were things that tried to address some of the not so great aspects in it, like US foreign policy, that definitely got a lot of people mad. Um, that actually, you've given me an idea for a future program, so thank you. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we are closing in about five minutes. Um, thank you all for coming, and hopefully, I will see you February 1st for um, Black Filmmakers. Uh, that has actually been a very fun program to research. So uh, I will see you all later, and great hopefully. Show, Oh, you're Thank welcome. you. Hopefully, very good. <laughs> thanks. Hopefully 2021 is, you know, is a little smoother than 2020. <laughs> yeah. Take care. The bar is so low 2021. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Good ideas. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank um, you. Bye-bye.